Okay, so welcome to this lecture on labor rights. There's tons we could cover. We're just going to hone in on some interesting issues um, and hopefully pique your interest. Um, there's so much more to learn about each of these things, but I wanted to give you a bit of an introduction just to some of the landscape of debate on labor rights, especially um, debates that are happening right now. One hugely important trend um, that's important for labor rights is the rise of the gig economy and in general, the rise of increasingly casual short term kinds of jobs. Um, we could also fold the rise of internships, especially unpaid internships, into this general trend. So there is now less of a chance that you will have a uh, full time pensionable, more or less permanent job or long-term job. Um, the tendency is more toward short-term, casual, part-time um, internships, um, as I mentioned. Um, and the gig economy is a really important part of that, but it's, it's important to note that it's not just Uber. It's a trend that's been happening for a while. It's increases in part-time work, increases in short-term contracts, and that kind of thing. So it's part of a bigger uh, trend that's been happening, not just in recent years with the rise of Uber and the like, um, but generally speaking, rising over the last few decades. Some analysts, those who speak in terms of neoliberalism um, as a variety of capitalism that has become ascendant, would certainly put these developments in that broader historical context. Um, so that's a kind of trend that's been happening really since the 70s or 80s, but it's really, really sort of kickstarting now. So let's talk about the gig economy in particular. So the gig economy, so Uber drivers or Lyft drivers are a really good example of this, or DoorDash um, uh, delivery drivers would be a good example of this kind of thing. They're in an interesting position. On the one hand, one nice thing that's actually quite an attractive feature for many such workers, not all, is that they kind of set their own hours, right? So they you know, they, uh, they decide if they want to uh, take on a particular assignment, they can say yes or no, they decide when they want to stop working, when they want to start working, do I feel like working today? So there's a huge amount of flexibility, which for many people these days is very, very important um, and very handy. So that's one thing. On the other hand, Uber drivers and similar sorts of workers um, present kind of a good deal for the bosses of Uber, um, right? So if they are, as they are now, considered legally independent contractors, uh, right, who just use Uber's services to connect with customers, uh, with potential riders, one thing that does is that Uber doesn't have to treat these drivers as employees and therefore employee protections in law such as minimum wages were applicable, um, health and safety um, regulations, anti-discrimination regulations, um, regulations about benefits, um, such as health insurance. None of that stuff um, is something Uber has to worry about because guess what? Uber doesn't employ these people. So if they're independent contractors, Uber does not have to worry about um, adhering to the rules that they would have with any workers they employed um, with respect to retirement, other benefits, health, you know, health insurance and so on, health and safety, etc, etc, etc. So there's right now a big debate because while some Uber drivers are people who just want to do, you know, a, one evening a week or something like that on a really flexible basis and it's just a kind of add-on, um, for them. On the other hand, Uber is, for, uh, just to use it as an example, Uber and Lyft are um, kind of squeezing out traditional um, taxis. So quite a few Uber and Lyft drivers are actually taxi drivers who's, who've been squeezed out. So not all Uber drivers are just sort of doing this as a, a side hustle, so to speak. Many Uber drivers are, you know, this is their job, right? This is their fundamental source of livelihood. And in effect, they really are like employees of Uber in the sense that 
um, Uber sort of has the equivalent of sort of hiring and firing, so it can discontinue their relationship with the driver. The driver is highly dependent on on Uber, and you know the driver is dependent on them to as a conduit for their income. They have very little power um, as individuals, and so on. So there's now a really, really lively debate about whether it's fair uh, that Uber drivers and and similar kinds of gig economy workers should be considered independent contractors. Um, which you know suits the uh, the company quite well, um, or workers, or should they be considered some kind of a hybrid, or does the whole thing show that you know our system, for example, of tying health insurance to your employment, does it show that something deeper is is amiss? Right, some people argue that that's the case. Um, right, that maybe this difference wouldn't be such a big deal. Right, if certain protections. Um, um, or benefits such as health insurance um, were not necessarily tied um, to one's particular job. That's of course a huge, um, a huge debate. Um, but I think it opens up to us um, a moral question about casual workers in general. So I want to talk about this trend in casualization a little bit. Um, and this is not from the perspective of an economist, right? So our interest uh, isn't in that because that's not our uh, expertise or question here. Our question is about, well, what do we think from a moral perspective of the rise of the kind of job that is casual, short term, um, part time, um, and therefore not tied to, uh, to benefits? Right. So if you work under a certain number of hours a week, right, your employer doesn't have to give you uh, certain benefits. Right. So obviously this arrangement, right, hiring more part-time workers um, at lower pay and fewer benefits saves uh, the bosses, right, saves the employer a lot of money. Um, right. Now what's interesting is that this kind of trend has happened in everything from food delivery and um, you know, retail all the way to higher education, right? Did you know, I'm sure some of you are aware of this and some of you are not, that quite a few in many high institutions of higher education, a majority of undergraduate courses are taught by low paid part-time workers with few or often no benefits such as health insurance. Um, either they are adjunct lecturers or adjunct professors, they are sometimes uh, grad assistants or grad fellows, so people who are still in graduate school but if effectively doing adjunct work. Um, and that there's been a co corresponding proportional decrease in full-time, um, longer-term workers del delivering your courses, right? So I myself am a tenure track uh, professor, and um, I worked for many years as an adjunct lecturer in various institutions of higher education, um, working for really poverty wages, uh, no health insurance. Well, there was after a while our union did um, where I did most of my adjunct work, did manage to get some modest um, concessions on healthcare for um, for some adjuncts. Uh, but in many institutions, um, adjunct lecturers have no benefits. They usually have no office. Um, they're very low paid. So, for example, I was teaching about ten years ago or so. I was teaching as an adjunct in New York City. Um, teaching the equivalent of a full-time load, so that three courses per semester and usually one or two in the summer as well. And I was making you know, around nineteen or twenty thousand dollars a year in New York City. You just have to pause to let that sink in for a moment. So actually many adjunct lecture lecturers qualify for food stamps because their wages are so low. Um, and of course, it's a really interesting story how that got to be, but I don't want to get us uh, too distracted here. But just suffice it to say that um, this trend, it's not just in one arena, right? So it's not just Uber drivers or it's not just in the restaurant industry. It's not just in retail. It stretches all the way right from, um, from stores to restaurants to higher education. Okay. So again, we might look at this from a moral perspective and say, is this just a way that 
kind of bosses, you know, are taking advantage of people so that they can get away with low pay and low or no benefits? Or is it something that uh, serves the general interest um, because of the demand for flexible workers? Um, I'd love to know what you what you think. Maybe many of you might have some experience um, of casual work um, and what you think about it. So one other um, very important issue right now is issues about low pay. Right. So the underlying issue is, well, you know, what do we do about that as a society? What ought we do morally about the fact that so many people are trying to cobble together part-time work, trying to cobble together casual work, and are having a hard time, right? So we were, I'm sure, very familiar with um, the struggle of so many people to put food on the table, to pay increasingly high rents, or um, keep up with a mortgage, and just support their family, even though they work many hours a week. So that's sort of the underlying moral concern. And think back to uh, the theories of justice and the, the moral theories that we studied earlier on. What do you think a libertarian would say about these matters? Right, A libertarian will tend to say that these things are um, unfortunate, but not necessarily unfair, unless we can uncover that there's some kind of force or fraud involved. Um, and I think while that may be the case in, in some um, specific cases where the libertarian will tend not to find uh, that in, in a lot of these situations, uh, whereas most egalitarians will find something at least sort of prima facie wrong um, with this kind of situation. Okay, um, so again, we might look at it as, you know, as a utilitarian. So what's the overall impact on society um, of these kinds of things? Is it overall a benefit, right? Because we get the, the benefit of all these people doing, uh, doing work for low pay. Um, or is it overall a, a drain on overall happiness, right? So what would the utilitarians say? What would the Kantians say? Um, right, I'd like you to think, think things through um, in, in terms of those uh, theoretical frameworks. So clearly there's a debate among economists about the impact of minimum wage laws. Um, right, we're not economists, right? some of you might be, I'm not, and this course isn't a course in economics. Um, so our focus isn't going to be on the economic issue, which is kind of under dispute. What is the impact of minimum wage laws? Um, there isn't consensus about whether that is generally positive, generally negative. Um, you'll still see economists disagree about that. Um, so our focus is going to be on the moral issue, right? Um, so let's let's say let's grant to um, you know the opponent of minimum wage laws that um, that minimum wage laws or living wage um, laws um, have a, a bad impact on the economy, right? Which is I emphasize not necessarily the case, but if, if we grant right to the opponent of minimum wage laws that it may um, result in the economy thriving less, then I think this question in, in bullet point number two really arises from the moral perspective. So if the economy couldn't do well on paying a living wage, right? So if paying a living wage to everybody where they weren't struggling to eat and pay rent and, uh, and so on, um, if that had a bad impact on the economy, then does that mean that there's something really sort of wrong with the, just the economy or, idea, or our ideas about how it's organized? Um, obviously, anti-capitalists, right, with, working within the, the Marxist or sort of left uh, traditions, um, will be nodding a very big yes uh, to that. Uh, but I don't think you need to be anti-capitalist to say that um, you know, if people are working full-time jobs and they still can't make it, then, you know, something uh, something seems to be amiss from a moral perspective um, that needs to be addressed. So my question morally is, well, what do we morally do about the fact that, and it is a fact, that so many people uh, work full-time or work more than full-time, right? Often either people are working one minimum wage job or often working two or cobbling together a number of part-time jobs as we saw in, in the slides on casualization and are still living in poverty, 
right, still struggling. And I'm, I'm sure many of you are, are highly familiar um, with this reality, right? Rates of poverty in Cincinnati are uh, extremely high. So that raises questions about, well, should there be a minimum wage? Is that the, the right way to, to, to go about things? Again, libertarians and egalitarians will, will tend to disagree about that. Um, this is also one reason why some people argue in favour of UBI, um, which is universal basic income. So some people think, um, and it's interesting to me that this idea is gaining a lot of traction, including among people who wouldn't consider themselves on the left of the spectrum. It's really interesting. Um, some people argue that the state should give everybody, right, everybody, a certain amount, usually it's quite a minimal amount, right, that just would sort of keep you out of uh, dire poverty kind of thing, but the, the, the exact kind of number really varies. Some people would be more generous, some people would leave it very, very minimal. The idea is that the government would give everybody a certain, what they call basic income, and it'd be universal, no questions asked, uh, no strings attached, no red tape. And the idea is um, that, um, well, the, the, it has, it's actually quite a complex idea, but, but one basic kind of uh, impetus behind it um, is that, number one, it would enable the state to simplify um, welfare supports, so make it sort of simpler, not have so many complicated schemes, but have sort of fewer schemes, and then sort of this one payment that would sort of keep everyone afloat to a reasonable level, and you'd reduce costs in terms of red tape and bureaucracy and so on and so forth. Um, number two, that it would enable people to move up between jobs, you know, with and, and you know between jobs and education more seamlessly, so they could really make more choices. Um, it would enable people uh, to engage in care work um, with more facility and so on. Obviously, it would cost money, right? <laughs> um, so uh, economists will debate about how you ought to do that with the savings in terms of red tape and just um, the gains in terms of eradicating poverty. Um, make it worth it because obviously people with more money would need to be would have to come from taxation in some respect unless as in as has been the case in I believe there was a scheme in uh, Alaska if memory serves correctly um, that um, where it didn't come from taxes but it came from dividends from oil um, so there are some places that have uh, a revenue stream where they can do this a little bit um, but ultimately, we would have to talk about what would a fair way be of doing that. So in, in any case, this debate about universal basic income is partly responding to this question, right? How do we, um, how do we figure out uh, a solution to this problem that whether some people are, are working a lot, some people are working less, but so many people are struggling. So how can we sort of set a floor beneath which no one should fall? Um, and obviously, uh, you know, with respect to UBIs, many people will find it um, prima facie unfair that, that somebody might potentially get money without working specifically for that money. Um, and, you know, obviously this is an interesting debate to be had about that, that, that we don't have time to get into. Some people argue that it would be a very good thing to decouple at least some income from work. I mean, you wouldn't be rich just, you know, um, on a universal basic income. The idea would be that most people would want more uh, than this kind of bare bones kind of allowances. So most people would choose to work. Um, but you'd find people being in less exploitative work, people would volunteer more because they wouldn't need to um, to work such long hours and so on and so forth. Um, so I think it speaks to some pretty deep-seated and very interesting um, debates about how we should do this whole economy thing. All right, so one last piece of the puzzle that I want to talk about and a uh, very obvious theme when you're talking about labour rights uh, is the question of unions and one thing that they do, namely uh, strikes. Interestingly, unions very rarely go on strike, uh, but strike power um, is perhaps the biggest um, weapon, if you like, that unions have. So first of all, as we said in the text, why unions? Why, why, why have them? And the fundamental answer is that for each individual worker, there's a massive power differential between them and their employer. 
Why? Well, many employers are very large entities that are very powerful, um, and the worker is just a person. Right? Um, typically, the worker needs the employer more than the employer needs the worker. Right? And what the worker has at stake is their livelihood. So the worker can't very easily just sort of tell the employer to go away. Right, because their livelihood is at stake. And I don't know about you, but I certainly couldn't just sort of walk away from my job um, on a whim and be fine, right? Um, for most of us, uh, losing our job is an absolute disaster for us and our family, right? Um, employers, generally speaking, aren't in that position, right? So if one worker leaves, um, it's it's not really disastrous, um, except in very unusual um, situations. Right? Maybe if you're a sports team and your you know star quarterback decides to walk away, um, <clears throat> all of a sudden maybe that might be pretty disastrous for you. But in general, that's highly unusual. Generally speaking, the power lies uh, with the employer because it's easier for the employer to walk away than for the worker. For most of us, again, really our sort of whole livelihood and um, a lot of how our life is organised in our home and so on and so forth depends on this job. Employers often very powerful, as we said in the text. They're often politically well connected. Sometimes if you work in, in, in the public sector, um, your employer sort of is in the state. Um, if you work for a large company, you're working for an entity that has a lot of influence, uh, both in terms of their importance to the economy and um, especially in the United States, but not exclusively in the United States, um, having huge influence in government uh, via donations, via lobbying, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so unions are there and have been there to balance out this power differential. So me as an individual worker, I don't have, really have any power um, if I go up against my employer um, and want to fight for my rights. But if all the workers in a workplace join together, then they do have some power. So it's, it's about sort of rebalancing uh, those power differentials. Now, I asked you to read the Elizabeth Anderson piece on uh, private employers, and I thought it was a really interesting uh, kind of different argument, right? So it's interesting, not because I necessarily expect you to agree with this or anything. I'm sure plenty of people will uh, find it totally unreasonable and plenty of people will find it uh, quite reasonable. Um, that's why it's interesting to read. Uh, but Anderson's take is really distinctive, right? So her, her take, her interpretation is that for her, private employers are a government. It's a form of government and it's a form of what she calls private government. In other words, um, like the, old, the European monarchs of old, right, governments that are private in her sense are um, governments that don't feel the need to tell the governed what the rules are or to justify those rules to them, much less have them have any say in it. And for Anderson, that's a really illegitimate form of government. And I'd love to know what you thought about her her analogy, right? Um, are private employers government, right? So she, she tries to make the case that, well, they control a lot of your life um, and they do so in a structured way as as, uh, as an organization as an, as an entity. Often they try and control uh, things that you do outside of work and we've talked about that in the context of uh, privacy. Um, so if it's a government, well then given a lot of people's fairly reasonable, um, you know, distrust or suspicion of excessive government intervention in people's lives. Um, if you sort of characterize private employers in that way, those arguments take on a really interestingly different sheen, right? Then it's like, oh, it's your corporate bosses who are impinging um, upon you. So what if we took those arguments and said, well, you know, if I conceive of my employer as a government, well, then it's a government in Anderson's view that's in serious need of reform, um, right? So you need to have the right of exit. So namely, uh, she argues for getting rid of non-compete clauses um, and argues in favor of, so if you're gonna have a legitimate government, most political philosophers these days would say, well, one thing that that requires is that the governed have some voice, right? They have some say in the rules that govern them. 
Um, and Anderson talks about a number of different ways that this can be done. Um, labor unions are obviously one traditional way to do it, but she talks about um, the situation in many European countries um, where there are various mechanisms such as um, workers having seats on company boards or um, having sectoral bargaining, so uh, councils where workers sort of, uh, uh, are a part of this and um, co-determine, right as the jargon goes, um, a lot of stuff like paying conditions and um, major moves by the company. Um, right, so I, I thought it was an interesting, fresh uh, uh, take in a, in a way I hadn't quite thought of um, employers in this way. So I'd be curious to see what you, you thought of, of that. Now, one thing that if you've been following the teacher strikes um, that we need to talk about is the moral status of strikes. Um, we saw much criticism of the teacher strikes um, in terms of inconvenience. Clearly, if your kid's school is shut down because of a strike, um, it's really inconvenient, right? So the students do lose out on something valuable, namely their education, and parents are put in you know, a bit of a headache, um, to be honest. Um, that's definitely the case. Now, the teachers, as we said in the text, had an extra argument available for them. So if you are a, uh, a public worker who works um, for some public good, right, so you teach, or you provide education to the public, which is a public good, then the teachers could, and they did, make the argument that, well, the inconvenience is worth it because this inconvenience is the only way that they have to fight for the public good of education. And it's noteworthy that many of the striking teachers um, were struggling not only for increases in pay for themselves, but, and some of them even more so, um, for better funding for the schools beyond just paying teachers, right? So more spending per student, books, um, you know, all of that kind of thing. So that was certainly one argument um, that teachers and other um, workers that produce public goods um, can, uh, can use. But what about others? So what if you just um, work in uh, some private sector industry and you make paper or, you know, uh, work in, in sales, right? So what, what if, you're, if you're not somebody um, who's, who's fighting for public, some public good like education? Well, I think you still have one argument available to you, namely that uh, causing disruption and inconvenience is really the only bar bargaining power that you have, right? So as we mentioned in the text, going on strike would have absolutely zero point whatsoever if it didn't cause inconvenience, right? That's why people try to stop people going on strikes. And if you go on strike, right, your bargaining chip as, you know, the, the union, right, or the, or the workers who are going on strike, your bargaining chip, your entire bargaining power is the inconvenience that you can cause by not working, right? So by not working, you show, oh, well, when I don't work, you know, all of this kind of bad stuff happens, right? But that must mean that, well, my work has value, my work has importance, um, and I'm showing that to you, right? It matters whether I show up, so you should treat me better, right? So that's the bargaining chip that you have. You don't have any other bargaining chip, really, um, except the uh, the threat of, of strikes. So the employer, if they're smart, wants to uh, minimize this disruption. They want to make sure you don't go on strike, or if you're already on strike, they want to make sure that you stop going on strike and you go back to work. So now they have to negotiate with you um, and ask, well, what will it take for you uh, to go back to work, right? So it's all about what we said at the beginning, right? Um, kind of re, uh, de redefining uh, those power differentials, right? So again, the argument, the fundamental argument is that um, strikes can be morally permissible even if they cause inconvenience because inconvenience is the only bargaining power that workers have to make sure they get treated fairly. Now, in principle, are there uh, in morally impermissible strikes? Well, sure, right? So you have to say, well, is the cause that the workers have in going on strike, so is their level of pay so low that they're justified in uh, causing inconvenience and using their bargaining power um, to, um, uh, to, to, to try and get better pay, right? Or are they already very well paid and sort of uh, 
causing inconvenience for something that isn't worth it. That's obviously going to vary um, by the particular strike that you're talking about. Um, but I think it's useful to uh, think of those um, issues um, in general terms. Um, and again, I'd be interested to hear what you thought, for example, about the uh, um, the wave of teacher strikes that happened um, fairly recently. One final thing, um, all of this kind of has happened in the context of uh, so-called right to work and the Janus decision by the Supreme Court. Um, what this did was remove uh, the right of unions to collect uh, what are called fair share fees. Um, one thing to note is that non-members of a union, so people who work at the workplace and are covered by the collective bargaining agreement negotiated by the union, but who are not members, they get all of the benefits of the union's work on the collective bargaining agreement. So you can either, you can go to the union for help with a grievance and you obviously gain all the benefits that the union has negotiated for you um, in the collective bargaining agreement. And yet under Janus, right, the, the Supreme Court decision that imposed right to work, um, non-members now don't have to pay anything for those services. They don't have to make any um, contribution um, to the costs of collective bargaining. Right. So from the union perspective, that's simply uh, free riding. Right. Whereas um, Mark Janus, the, the, um, for whom the, the Janus case is named, um, he said it was a matter of free speech. So he argued that making him pay um, a lower um, fee um, to, to the union um, to participate in things that he potentially doesn't agree with, right? So he didn't necessarily agree with what was in the collective bargaining agreement or so on and so forth. So his argument was, well, why should I pay? Uh, why should I be made pay um, for it? So his, his argument again, well, it's a matter of free speech. I shouldn't be compelled to um, to pay. It's almost as though I'm being forced to support um, the union. And then on the other hand, the unions were arguing that, you know, somebody like him um, would benefit from all the work of the union, right? So if they got an increase in pay in their next contract, he would get it too. Um, but the members were paying for the costs of collective bargaining. So, for example, you have to have somebody uh, who knows how to do it. There are costs to, uh, to negotiating and administering a collective bargaining agreement. Um, you have to provide people who are experts in grievances right, to help you. You could, they would get all of that, but you would be a free rider if you didn't pay something toward that. So that's a major disagreement. That's now the law of the land. Um, there are going to be future struggles along those lines. So stuff like um, in some states, they, they were trying to demand that unions engage in recertification elections um, yearly or on some very, very um, similar basis. Um, and I would anticipate that we'll see um, a lot more disagreement and struggle over um, how how much unions can do um, and uh, what restrictions they're subject to in the future. And obviously that's a kind of broader political matter. Um, but from a moral perspective, right, I want us to think about, um, you know, the moral right to have a union, to, uh, to engage in collective bargaining, and then what unions may do to press their case. Um, obviously the strike is kind of the furthest end of that. Um, Usually uh, unions are engaged more in the boring everyday stuff of negotiation um, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's a set of questions um, that are, um, I think, always going to be topical. OK, look forward to hearing uh, and seeing your comments um, on the board. Thank you.